Hi, everybody. My name is Tehama Lopez Bonyasi, and I am an associate professor here at the Carter School, and we are so excited to have you here. Um, as you may know, if you've joined other panels already, um, Peace Week is organized by the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution here at George Mason University. And each semester, um, Carter School Peace Week brings together faculty and students, alums, uh, friends and partners from across the peace and conflict resolution community for a week-long conversation um, and to really think about how effectively to address urgent issues of peace and justice. Our theme for this Peace Week overall is called Ideas and Action, Integrating Theory and Practice for Peace and Conflict Resolution. And the title of this panel, as you know, is Violence Interrupters in Our Nation's Capital. Um, this is the first in what we hope will be a series of virtual meetings in which the Carter School learns from people throughout the United States who are working in their own communities and neighborhoods to curb gun violence and other dynamics of um, related interpersonal conflict. Getting this panel off the ground was a team lift. Um, I wanna thank our Transition Justice Lab, particularly Bernice Hurd, Marissa Jordan, Matthew Mendel, Susan Hirsch, Sarah Atif, and our friend Liz London. The panelists featured today represent Washington DC's Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement. And so I'd like to read um, a little bit about their, you know, their biographies before we jump into our panel. We have two panelists today. Um, Dana R. McDaniel is the Deputy Director for the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement called owns well you well you'll hear that a lot i think i'm saying it. am i saying it right is it ones or owns ones thanks. ones all right so i've gotten my mistake out of the way ones thank you and um and so one specializes in fostering community-based um, strategies to help prevent violence and increase public safety in this capacity, Ms. McDaniel oversees programming and community-based services focused on providing resources and interventions for at-risk individuals and or at-risk places impacted by violence in the district. An alumna of the University of Maryland College Park with concentrations in sociology, child development, criminal justice, and developmental psychology, professional certifications include strategic planning, community interventions, positive youth development, restorative justice, trauma-informed care, therapeutic counseling, and crisis behavioral interventions. Wow. Charles King is our second panelist, and he is a native of DC who was born and raised inside of the city. Mr. King has several years of professional experience in the field of violence intervention and commonly referred to as a credible mentor. Mr. King has taken trainings over the past several years to support his multiple roles in violence intervention initiative. Mr. King is currently employed with the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement ONES um, as a restorative justice outreach specialist in the violence intervention program. Duties include, but are not limited to, engagement with community members who may have conflict and need a source to help resolve that conflict. I would be remiss if I did not know that we are down one panelist due to the fact that she has lost her voice. Um, Keisha Barnes, who serves as the violence intervention pro um, program manager for ONES, was instrumental in our planning. And I wanna thank her for her time and for her insights. So here we are, we're about to get going. We, after our panel, we'll have a Q and A um, session and, um, and continue our conversation there. So the first question is for Dana McDaniel. Please tell us about the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement. What is the nature of your work and how do you describe ones within the ecosystem of other violence intervention efforts in Washington, DC? And thank you to Hema for that question. Again, I am Dana McDaniel. I am the deputy director here at ONES and really pleased to be here. A lot of the work here at ONES, uh, it's a very community driven agency. Our agency was started back in 2015 after the NEAR Act, the Neighborhood Engagement Achieves Results Act was implemented thanks to our um, faithful council members, Kenyon McDuffie and Treyon White. As a result of that act, we opened up our office here uh, over in uh, the former 6D um, that we then uh, transformed into a community hub. 
We're a very community-driven agency. Um, we use the community to identify what's needed. Um, we also use the community to identify solutions, and we go a step further, the community to actually implement those solutions. So our key role is to get behind the residents who live, work, and thrive in their communities and work with them to empower them to make the changes they want to see in, in the community. Um, as the violence, one of the violence interrupter teams, we are one organ in a larger body of violence intervention work. Uh, we have partners like the Credible Messenger Mentors, which I had the privilege of, of working and starting over at the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services, where they prim primarily provide mentoring services to our at-risk individuals. We have the roving leaders over with the Department of Parks and Recreation, who primarily provide a recreational type of engagement for our at-risk individuals. We have Cure the Streets, which is one of our closest violence intervention partners, and they take a more place-based approach, a very visual, present, 10 or more boots on the ground at a time in one spot uh, approach. And then there's us, ones, we take a more person-based approach. We like to identify key individuals and work with them a little bit more intimately and silently uh, to put in place formal and sometimes informal peace agreements uh, between communities, as well as community planning and other ideas, events, and activities. Okay, I'm starting to see the, the, the bigger kind of picture and where you're situated. And that's, and that's great. And I, I love learning about, you know, what's going on in DC. I don't live in DC, but like, given that we're neighbors, we need to be aware of what's going on and how we can partner with other people as well. So thank you for that. Um, my next question is for Charles King. And it's, it's kind of maybe a couple questions together, but what is it that brings people to the work of violence interruption and can it be done by anybody? Do people need certain training? Do they need certain experiences? Uh, good evening, I'm Charles King. And to start off with your question, the first part of the question, what, what brings people to violence and interruption work? I'll start with that by saying, um, a lot of times it's, it's a lot of the community members who know that they have the ability to intervene into in incidents that may be taking place in their community and want to see better. So they step in and want to do it. Um, they are actually identified uh, through a vetting process a lot of times to make sure that when they are uh, ready to step up, that they can actually perform the duties and that, you know, that they're not too emotionally attached to the situation because, you know, that can be a, a thing also. The second thing about it is, uh, can it be done by anybody? Uh, I really won't say that it can be done by anybody because if it can be done by anybody, then um, we wouldn't just be looking at community members, which we don't just look at community members. We look at people outside of communities, but just knowing that bringing someone from outside of a community sometimes is usually not as, as effective as if having someone inside of the community that was born and raised there, as opposed to maybe an outsider per se, because of the connection in community based on uh, relationships, family uh, ties, and um, a multitude of other things from being there for a multitude of years, pretty much predominantly the average person who does violence intervention in, in a community pretty much is a lifelong resident in that community. And um, what does the day of a violence interrupter, well, do we need any training? Yes, there's most definitely training because you will be faced with a host of things that may for some of the individuals who are doing the work can be triggers. So before we allow them to go into the community, we give them some tools that they will need in order to uh, face some of the things that they may face and that maybe result back to being a person they may used to be. Uh, and that training isn't just a one and done training. Uh, we do refreshers throughout the year, uh, every year uh, that, that the budget is uh, set aside for this actually initiative, training is, is included in that budget. So training is very, very imperative because it's more than just uh, going out and speaking to someone. People have to understand that this is a very unique skill set that individuals have. It's not just a person walking up. It's a, it's a lot of people really taking the time to understand that it's a skill and that, you know, what they will do may be uh, a direct link to saving someone's life or something of that nature, if that answers your question. Right. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, can you tell us, like, in the day of a life of a violence interrupter, what does that look like? Uh, so 
on a typical day, get up, get yourself together, get mentally prepared before you leave your home because you understand that you work in the field of humans. Uh, you never know what you're going to encounter when you walk out of the house and you go into some of these communities. Uh, if nothing is really transpiring or you already have an incident going on, it can look two ways. We can go into a situation where people may be on high alert. They may be very emotional due to an incident taking place, or you may go into a community where everything is calm and you know, you're just there checking in with the residents, seeing what's going on, uh, trying to be more proactive than reactive is our approach for what we do. Uh, being very proactive, being in the community, having that conversation with people and being able to gauge what's going on and maybe being able to intervene before it even gets to violence. That's what a violence intervention worker actually does. People may think that we just show up after an incident, but nowhere there prior to an incident even happening. That's how we're even able to even have the relationship to even speak on an incident once it does transpire or if something does happen. Whether we know or not, people you know are more receptive to a person when they show up and um, are already there. So in a day of a violence intervention, we're making touches, uh, continuous touches. Uh, I'm meeting with my team at the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement, Ms. McDaniels and several others, uh, Ms. Barnes also, and several others who you know work with me on a day-to-day -day basis because we may share information about something we know uh, that the other may not know or just you know compare notes in order to make sure that we're uh, touching everything that needs to be touched in, in, that, in that aspect. It sounds like a lot of communication all the time, right? That's got to yes, be key. Yes, yes. A, a lot of communication. Communication is the key. Um, uh, the breakdown in communication can be very detrimental in with the work that we do. It can be um, it can be a matter of um, something going good or something going bad based on a, a lack of communication. Right. Um, so thinking about you know what you just told me, it, in addition to communication, it also seems like it's really important to build relationships. So how do you go about building relationships in the communities that you work in? Um, for, for me and my team, a lot of us have already been engaged in, in this capacity of work for quite some time, unofficially with the one's office, maybe in different capacities, as Ms. McDaniels told you, uh, dealing with credible messages. Uh, most of us have probably had an opportunity to engage with a certain demographic or population where we're already known. Uh, majority of us who work in my office are DC native base uh, residents. So, you know, um, even if they don't know someone from that community, um, being able to vouch for that person, hey, this is Dana, she's good people. So, hey, make sure that she's good when she come around here or Dana wants to talk to you. Things of that nature are very imperative and important when you know um, just building those relationships because hey, I'm not going to know everybody and they're not going to know everybody. But if we pool all our resources together, we'll have one big umbrella to cover, to cover everything. Right. So then, so you've got, you've got people introducing other people, you know, this is, these are, these people are within kind of the network of, of safety, right? They're in the network of looking out. And, um, but then there's, I'm just thinking there's got to be some questions about visibility and rec and being recognizable. So how do you make yourselves like visible in in the communities or recognizable in the communities when you, you know you're coming in oh we're visible through a multitude of things I actually have on a shirt today that actually tells you what office i'm from right i wear a id badge identifying myself we have a multitude of different types of ways we have gear with our logo on it and we are also team with uh different community-based organizations that are funded from out of our office who are based in certain communities. So our presence is known when we're in those communities with them also. But uh, one of the main things is, you know, making sure that we're properly identified when we come um, with, with different logos and things. And, and to be truly honest, it can be very important for you to have those logos for a multitude of reasons, not just for the uh, people in the community to identify you, but for you to also stick out to people outside of the community that may be visiting the community and see you somewhere else and say, hey, you work for the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement. Uh, would you like to, we need your assistance in our community. Right, right. Yeah, to spread the word. Yes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, and while you were speaking, I saw Miss McDaniel holding up a. Um, she's she's got she's got the logo. I love it. Um, I have my next question for Miss McDaniel. Um, so there's got to be a whole lot of things unfolding at the same time, right? Um, so communication is really important for keeping these going. But how does your office 
track and maybe the word triage comes to mind. How do you do that when these dynamics of conflict are unfolding? Like, do you have a process for analyzing and strategizing? How do you do this? Good question. Um, so we do have an incident follow-up process that we implement, and it happens in different phases and stages. Immediately after an incident, we do do an immediate uh, triage. Our violence interrupters are expected to provide us some form of update within four hours, if it's within the working hours of the day, which is up to about 9 p.m. Uh, anything after 9 p.m., we receive an MPD report every morning at about 6 a.m. that lets us know what violence took place in the city. If any of those areas are ours, we do a 930 call every morning with our full VI team, and we kind of talk through what took place yesterday or last night. Here's where incidents were. Does anybody have any preliminary information? We look at what happened, if there were any key players involved. We read the narrative and try to make sense of it, and then we kind of strategize immediately next steps. The immediate next steps always have something to do with making contact with our most at-risk folk in those communities. Sometimes that's physical contact, but if it's not safe, if we know we've had an exchange of gunfire, for example, we may do, uh, thanks to technology, a FaceTime check-in with those key individuals who we know we want to mark them safe. And then within seven days, we do a, a visible, uh, physical visit to the community to make sure that there are no breaches in the environment. For example, one thing we recognize is in every single community, um, there's an attack point. There is a spot and a location where the enemies come to do their thing and attack you. So we try to visit those spots and advocate for some environmental changes like speed bumps or, or fences to help deal with the point of attack. And then we do a, a weekly follow-up on our incidents. Every Friday, we take a look at the incidents of the week prior and just check in. For, we're looking for two key things, well, a few key things. Uh, one, did it involve our key folk? Uh, and if it did, what does the outreach look like to those individuals? Um, two, what happened? What was the, you know, was this us? Was it interpersonal? Was it a domestic incident? And then our immediate next steps, what did, what did you do about it? What did we do about it? Or what are we planning to do about it? And then we do a monthly check at the end of the month to look back at everything, every incident for the past month to make sure we've properly captured for lack of better word, motive, but what happened, uh, whether or not it involved our individuals and what key strategies we put in place. And we also grade ourselves on that. I monitor our, our violence intervention work is implemented by three different grantees right now. So it's not government staff, it's contracted staff. And so we measure their performance with their ability to respond to an incident. And then we support that with our in-house staff, if need be, if you don't have the relationships or if the response wasn't really strong, then we employ our own internal team to follow up. Wow. Okay. So, it, I mean, I'm thinking this is like, tw this is a 24 seven, like, let's get, you know, like people like deep, deep commitment from yeah. the office, from people who are contracted. Wow. Um, I want to flag for, for later on, it's maybe in a and a a question about design, because the way you're talking about, um, you know, thinking about like speed bumps, like it's things like this that right, you change an environment and it becomes a different type of location. So let's let's put that over because that sounds really interesting. Um, wow, thank you very much. I have another question for um, Mr. King and it's a follow-up. I mean, it's really a continuation here, but what happens after, um, what happens after an incident of violence intervention? So, I mean, is there anything that you can add to what Ms. McDaniel said there? Um, just to elaborate on what Ms. McDaniel said, uh, we do take initiative to try to, you know, triage an area and make sure that, you know, uh, entry points of uh, concern are addressed. Um, we also, you know, go into communities and we try to just be very hands on with those people. Uh, mm -hmm. Being hands on after an incident is imperative. Uh, that's how we really are able to do the work. Um, Everyone involved with this work is, is pretty much like a 24-7 job, literally between the contractors and my office. Um, I can get a text on a survey from Ms. McDaniels, can you do uh, A, B, and C, right? And it's no problem, I do it. It's no problem uh, because I care. Uh, understanding that uh, just, you know, the, the, the follow-up to this work is really caring. 
right? If you're in this work just for a paycheck, I think you may be in the wrong field of uh, profession because it really takes dedication from the heart to uh, do, do this work. And, and that's what we do uh, as a follow up on top of everything that Ms. Daniels, Ms. McDaniel said. Uh, we actually do what we do from the heart because it has to come from the heart to do it on a Saturday, a Sunday, a Monday, a Tuesday mm -hmm. at eight o'clock at night, at nine o'clock at night, at three o'clock in the morning, because some people have no no limit to when they reach out to you. If someone is shot at three o'clock in the morning, and they have your phone number. Hey, they're going to call you at three o'clock in the morning if you come across their mind as a person that they, they feel they need to talk to. And, you know, that that's what we do for a living. So that's kind of like just to add on to what Miss McDaniel said mm -hmm. and speaking on the 24 seven thing. Yes, it's if you're in this work, you're in this work. Right. Right. You know, I was, I was thinking a lot of people will, will will hear snippets of the things that you do. And they're they're probably also wondering. So what's the, what, what's the role of the police here? Because you're doing something that is, you know, you know, at least, you know, overlapping circles with their work. So, you know, what is your working relationship with local law enforcement partners? That's a great question. And it's a common question because um, it's, an, we are both trying to attempt the same goal. And so people like to understand how the two work together mm -hmm. right now. Uh, so eventually we want to see a narrative uh, where there's an improved trust between our communities and police. Uh, right now, our communities are used to being penalized by police, so the relationship is not a very amicable one, uh, but eventually we want to change that narrative and show communities that police work for you, and we want to work with you to teach you how that relationship works, how to engage and involve police on the proactive and positive side of what we need and what we do um, so that you now see them as a partner and not a responder to trouble. Um, we have a one-way relationship with MPD. Um, we contact them when we need supports or presence in certain communities. If we know there's a large candlelight vigil at immediately after a homicide, we'll notify MPD, hey, there's gonna be a big vigil at this location. Are you guys available to provide presence or coverage? Okay. Um, and we also um, contact them for other supports, uh, key events or activities aside from vigils, maybe a funeral, uh, a cookout or something may be happening. Aside from that, we're not in a place, we're not sharing information. We don't talk cases. Um, we both are um, simultaneously made aware of rising tensions in communities. They're, they get their information from one place. We typically get ours from community. And MPD does share with us every morning though, of incident reports of incidents that have taken place in communities. And if we ever do need additional info, we can call them to ask, hey, was there ever an arrest in that case? Did you guys get the name? We wanna check and make sure it's not one of our guys. Mm -hmm. But it's a very one-way relationship. MPD does not demand information from us. They do not ask us to support them in any investigations, to support them in any uh, strategies to corral bad guys. Uh, they, they very much work with us on the engagement side of the work, community driven, community based, and in a very how can I help you approach mm -hmm. and which we appreciate. And so we've been working closer with them and, and trying to do things like walks and other ways to show the community that we're partners with police and, and teaching both sides, both community and police, how to work through those trust issues and work together. Right. That's a, that's a tall order, I'm sure. Yeah, lots of um, And getting the message out that especially that, you know, that you while partners are not uh, sharing certain types of information, I mean, I think that would probably go some, some way in building trust, right? So that they know people can come to you with a certain level of confidence, right? Or confidentiality, perhaps, right? Um, that sounds really important. Um, I have another question that's kind of related to the communication part, getting messaging out. Um, and this is for Mr. King. So one of the things that, that people in... Um, in peace studies and conflict resolution have been thinking a little bit more about is about the role of social media. And especially, you know, in this pandemic where we've all had to kind of get on, you know, get online in some way. But, you know, think about the role of social media in conflict resolution. What role does social media play in your work and in, in creating conflict possibly and also in resolving? Uh, it plays a very important part. Um, it's probably the biggest part to date uh, as in as in today's world, as in modern technology, with uh -huh. so many people having a, a ability to have a platform to have a voice now, uh -huh. as opposed to uh, 
So I say 20 years ago, 15 years ago, you, you had a conflict because you bumped into someone in the community or whatever that may look like, or he say, she say. Uh -huh. uh, now, uh, the negative side of social media, I'll speak on first, the negative side of social media will be, hey, someone is taunting someone um, on social media based upon an uh, event that may have happened. Uh, they may be taunting someone's death, right? They may be, uh, it, it, they may have an interaction because someone made a comment on a post that was negative and feel like when I see that person, we're going to have a problem. Uh, that that's one of the biggest things that the negative, uh, the negative, I will, I guess what I would say, uh, representation of information that's put out on social media is very, is very high. We have more negative than positive. That's why you can get a thousand views on a, let's say a murder post and only a hundred views on a graduation. Uh, it, it speaks to the volume of the nature of society and where we're at as a people with being desensitized. Mm -hmm. And that plays out in, in our in our arena of work because uh, of course they have this immediate link where they can communicate negatively or positively through social media. That's going to beat us to any scene of the crime. That's going to beat us to any neighborhood. If I put a post up right now and we're on this call and someone responds negatively, right? I have two options, respond negatively or respond positively or th the third option, don't respond at all. But with the immaturity of some of the uh, people that we may deal with or their understanding of communication, they don't sometimes have that ability to address that in the manner that I just spoke of and it usually comes off in a, in a negative way. The positive way uh, is having maybe two people who had conflict in a picture together and posting it. Oh. And just seeing the impact of that. Um, I can speak of that personally for myself. I've had conflicts with people in my life at times when I was younger. And at this point in my life, I post pictures with those same gentlemen and I know that that impacts others. So that's the positive play of social media. When someone sees pictures such as the one I'm speaking about for myself personally and say, well, if they can get it together, we can get it together, right? Uh, right. If they can resolve it, we can resolve it because we understood that they had a conflict. So social media works in those two ways for us in our field. Miss um, McDaniel is always trying to proposition um, guys who consider themselves opposition, who really don't have an opposition, but opposition uh, to try to unite uh, through different venues or uh, different ways of expressing itself. Usually a lot of guys here doing music. So Miss McDaniel likes to try to see if they can connect on music and maybe we can do something where we could put a song out with you two guys. And what better way of advertising that than, hey, click the link in my bio on social media or taking the picture of them to in the studio and posting it, or however that may look. So that's the role of social media in the work that we do, uh, just to sum it up for the sake of time. Well, that, I, I, that's really uh, heartening, right? Because so many things that I hear about with social media, you know, th these spirals of like negativity and and to know that you got, we can use this as a tool in some other way. Um, and I think, you know, thanks for kind of putting us on notice because, you know, I'm a Gen X and I use social media, but I don't, you know, my my way of thinking about, about conflict or, you know, uh, rumors or things like that, you know, they're very like, in-person type of thing and so the you know the, you have we have to think about about conflict in this in this other space and so I, I really appreciate you kind of pointing those things out for us um so social media i think of it you know this is this is part like the advent of um how technology is changing um in other ways neighborhoods are changing and People talk a lot about gentrification in Washington, D.C. People all over this country talk about gentrification in Washington, D.C., right? Um, it's, it's well known at this point. And so, you know, we, we'd like to know, does gentrification contribute to the violence that your office aims to interrupt? Um, and, and if so, how does that play a part? That's a great question and a, and a very sticky one um, because we have to be honest about some realities and some social ills that exist amongst us that drives violence. To be quite frank, gentrification has literally divided our city into black and white or rich or poor. Um, I am watching segregation evolve in our city to where new DC literally will not even say hello to old DC. So we now have neighbors who are total strangers there's a total disconnect between new DC and old DC. 
Um, so much so that, the, that we're receiving calls for help and support in communities for things that should be community led or community driven, like, hey, I've got too much trash on my sidewalk. We are trying to teach these new DC and old DC how to work together to resolve those things. So it's quite concerning and it's becoming more acerbated um, because the, the poor DC and black DC feel ostracized and left out and un, uninvested. Uh, we've watched new investments come into the city for new DC that we could never have even dreamed of. Um, things like legalized marijuana, where I have buddies who are still incarcerated for once selling marijuana. Um, so we watch amenities pop up for New DC and it, and it makes you feel very isolated and left out. So now we're having to create our own culture. So now you're seeing communities with 150 people cookouts because there are no other spaces where we're being welcome or invited to exercise our culture. Um, so we're watching our, 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 our inner city black folk create their own culture separately from what the city has invested in. So we do uh, wanna speak to that and we have uh, begun to, to draw light on the need for us to invest in the social interest and cultural needs of my people. Um, one of the ways it's impacting violence is gentrification has led to the closing down of a lot of communities where we all have grown up. And we're shutting down communities and forcing them to move in other places or move together. And it has led to immediate conflict, immediate misunderstanding, overcrowding, and the homelessness that we are ex witnessing and experiencing is quite scary, especially for myself and Mr. King, as well as our partner, Kenya Lewis and Keisha Barnes. All of us come from the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services, and we all landed here at ONES. And we've watched kids who we had when they were at DYRS are knocking on our door here now because they're homeless and the shelters are shut down or the group homes are shut down or the community where they once lived is now dilapidated and being built into something different. So when we're combining communities the way we are, when we've got guys couch surfing all over different communities the way that we do, a lot of our most recent homicides were triggered by uh, what we call hood hopping, community hopping. So people are looking for new homes and they go into new communities hoping to be welcomed and things go awry and we're ending up with victims. So we're really uh, being intentional about our thoughts around how we invest moving forward, about drawing light to some of the things that are needed, especially the recreational cultural needs of my people. Um, there are a lot of investments we're making as a city from skate parks to bike lanes. We have to invest in the things that my people are interested in from Studio, music studios to fashion design. ATV riding is a passion for my boys. We have to remove some of the criminalizing that we've placed on things that are just our culture um, that are criminalized and illegal um, so that we can be free to express what we love to do without police sirens or, or being punished for just being our, our very outdoor selves. Um, so it's something that is important to us. It's something that we that impacts our work and it's something that we advocate for when we can. I love that is so um, you gave us some real great specifics to, you know, and, and let's let's keep let's keep bringing that out. Um, another question that I have for and, and Ms. McDaniel, if you could follow up on this. So so given that there's especially uh, with gentrification, right, there's 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 a new there's a new D.C. community and an old D.C. community. And how can people work alongside your office and your team? and violence interrupters. Uh, and maybe there's different things um, that, that people can do given what part of the community they're from. No, that's a great point. And because, we're our, a, because we are a community-driven agency, we absolutely need the community in order to thrive. This isn't a, uh, an invite for um, uh, possible partnership. It is mandatory that the community uh, is side by side, actually in front of us as a part of this work. And some of those ways are maybe you're identifying what your community needs. Maybe you've observed and you can say, hey, we need a playground, for example. Many of our communities do not. We have 22 priority communities, more than 50% of them do not, more than 70% of them do not have playgrounds for children. Um, and, and then, so we trickle into other things where there's no place for us to play. So identifying what your community needs. 
um, offering ideas to meet those community needs. And maybe you don't want to do them, but maybe you at least say, hey, we could really use A, and you identify those resources and we can work to make those happen. Attending or promoting any community events. We want to work with the community you guys create. You know what you need. If you want to do an event, we want to get behind you. Uh, so the community he knows, oh, this is Miss Thelma's event. We'll be there. Uh, ones can be a silent partner in the back. We provided a lot of what you see, but we've got on a Miss Thelma shirt today because we're supporting uh, the community. Um, letting us know what's working and what's not. You know, Ones is doing our best, but as we go through, and this is new, you know, our violence intervention work has gone unfunded over a decade. We're mm -hmm. only four years old now. I'm trying to get to the day, uh, get to the number. MPD is 161 years old. I hope to make it there and may, hopefully violence is and around that long, right. but of course the community safety and engagement needs will be. Uh, so being able to tell us what's working and what's not so we can continue to build and hopefully we can last 20, 40 years uh, engaging communities. Um, also helping us establish some community codes and community culture. Uh, what is it you wanna see in your community? I had to work to do that in my own community. Uh, I am a third generation Langdon Park, Ward 5 native resident. And my community was plagued by a 20 year old war. Um, so I had to work with the, with the folk around me. We had to reestablish some rules and codes like no parking right here after 1 a.m. or I'm gonna come out in my robe and shoo some folk away. Um, and then community conversations. We ones, and as we mentioned in that first question around gentrification, we recognize the gap, and now we're trying to find ways to, to bridge the gap um, with seniors and young people, with new DC and old DC, with mothers and sons, but finding ways to create conversations for those community residents that are naturally in conflict because what you're interested in is disrupting my living uh, or what you're interested in can't happen here anymore. So finding ways to, or what I'm interested in is being pushed out. Where can I exist safely? How can we make this uh, acceptable for me and welcoming for me? So finding ways to bridge the gap between communities and having community residents bring those issues forward so we can help facilitate these conversations. Right, wow, okay. I have I, I'm right I'm making notes of other things to that to spin off of but um before we do I would like to to ask Mr. King another question um and this is really another piggyback situation does your office have any particular needs that can be met by the greater community so I mean if this is something that's you know if you want to think about it in the neighborhoods if you want to think about in DC if you want to think about you know kind of the DMV even um what, what, what does your office need? Uh, our office need everything. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not going, I'm going to start that off. And I said uh, wholeheartedly, we're not turning down any partnerships or uh, opportunities to come to the table and speak with us. Uh, uh, I was told once in my life that you never know uh, when a no is going to be a year. So uh, we're most definitely open to anything, but to be specific, uh, we most definitely need some of the partners in the community to be willing to accept some of the people that we deal with into their establishments uh, of employment uh, to give them the opportunity to have the opportunity to make a decent wage of living. Uh, one thing we do understand with economic stability there is usually less violence, right? Uh, if you look at where the violence is at, if you look at DC as a whole right now, based upon the, 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 the record number of murders we had last year, I can just about tell that they was all pretty much DC native residents and they wasn't people who as Mr. McDaniel was speaking on was gentrifiers and now when I say gentrification I'm not speaking of no color I'm speaking of people who merged here because what I do understand about this city is that gentrification looks just like me also right it looks like uh everyone it's it's a it's a it's a rainbow uh sometimes we we identify it in a certain way but I understand that it's a rainbow just from my engagements in my personal life uh the resources most definitely employment uh but we also need we need people to start engaging with people say hi to that person that you see outside they've been here for 30 years you know uh i can speak to a situation just as miss mcdaniel you said uh, the lack of communication um i was sitting on a friend of my aunt's porch one day a couple of years back maybe about five years ago and someone called the police on us and the police literally pulled up on me and asked me and him do we live around here and, you know, we had to like, he had to go and stick the key in the door, open the door. And they was like, oh, someone called and said that. But those are the type of things we're talking about. If we have someone calling the police on us, uh, just imagine how they view. And we weren't doing anything. 
Right. We're two we're two middle aged men, so we don't fit the description uh, of of a stereotypical what they would say of young black male right now as they look. We're two middle aged men, and that what was done to us. So can you imagine how a younger gentleman in this city may be viewed? Mm-hmm. Um, we need to break that stigma because we don't have no problem. Like literally, the people who've been here. You can walk up the street with your dog. We'll move out the way, right? And, and we don't have no problem because it's a respect thing. The respect is already here, but sometimes it doesn't be a two-way street. So I, I really think that the line of communication, I think that if people should, you know, engage with my office or reach out to my office or look us up on the online and find out what we're about, find out what type of resources that we offer so that maybe we can offer those resources. Or when you see a gentleman or, or a young lady in your community that may be uh, below standards, you can say, hey, hey, you checked out the Wands office because they have a Pathways program there, right? They have the uh, uh, Wands Leadership Academy there. They have FSS if you're a victim of violence. The things that, you know, that we do have there, some people don't know. And I just think that, you know, if we partner with more people and we have our message out, I think that we can uh, serve more people. I think the more people that we serve through partnership, the, the less incidents we'll probably have because they'll understand that you do have a Charles King there who's trained in restorative justice who may be able to be the mediator between us to, to, to get our message back and forth so that we can come and have a, a, a civilized conversation and it right. doesn't reach violence, right? You do have a Dana McDaniels there who can speak for women and when there's a conflict who can come in and say, hold up, I'm a woman, I understand what y'all are going through. So uh, yes, I most definitely think that we need a partnership with any and everybody that's willing to come in and, and meet with us, speak with us, hear us out, follow us on social media, look at our uh, look at our website, whatever. Just all all partnerships are needed, and that isn't just DC. That's DC, Maryland, and Virginia, because we do understand that a lot of DC residents, hey, they live in Maryland now, right? But they come back to DC in order to. Uh, visit their village, right? They live in Virginia because they're, they've they been uh, ostracized and pushed out through gentrification where they're not even familiar with the community they can afford. So they come back to the communities that, they can, that they're can familiar with, but they can't afford to live there anymore. Mm-hmm. Right, no, I, that's a, it, it, it really is a regional matter um, when you're thinking about kind of the transition justice piece of it and, and what, 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 causes people to to move and and you know we know that there are people who come back every weekend right on on, for church or for the mosque or something go back to where their home um you know places of worship are even though they may live other places right so there's a lot of moving around there um i have one more question i'm gonna ask before i open it up to q a and it was one that we were thinking about but it's it was a little bit more technical in nature and um and so that is you know, in the time that you've been involved with ones, Ms. McDaniel, um, have you observed any societal and or environmental trends that like inform the way that, that you work or expand the capacity of your work? Absolutely. I think one of the trends that has been most concerning and shocking for me is the uh, constant and profitable promotion of Black male death. So the rap music is the key um, trigger and ailment um, leading and driving a lot of the homicide and killings uh, of my people. And keep in mind, I'm a rap artist as well, and I'm 40 years old. So I've watched rap music evolve from hip hop, hipping and a hopping to I'm going to kill you with this AK-47 and the radio will play it without a problem. If we were to switch the N-word out in these in this music for another term from another racial group, uh, a homosexual slur, it would be banned. It would not be allowed. Somehow, we are the media platforms that the main music industry, social media, YouTube, it is permissible to sell Black Death concerts, huge concerts where the entire song is about a black boy killing and shooting another black boy. If I made a song about child molestation, I'd be banned right away. If I made a whole album about it, it would seem insane. But somehow the murder of black males is so profitable in this country. And it's scary and concerning that it's being allowed the way that it is. And I think that's the biggest trend lately that has really impacted and driven our work. 
um, because we don't just see it in music, it's in movies, it's on YouTube and social media, but this drive of the death of black males is driving our social interactions as a people. And I would love to see the music industries, the TV industries be held accountable for the prom promotion of slaughter of my people. Again, no other crime is being sang and sung in songs. No other crime uh, has um, YouTube, millions of YouTube hits. Um, if I were, were to change the N word with any other word, it'd be banned and not allowed. So it's just frightening. And it makes you wonder what is at the root of what we are doing here and who can help me with this? I need help with this. We've done a study here at ONES, a social media study on the rap music. And we were able to pull out a rap rivalry that thanks to Trap Geek, not only did it get over a million hits, it led to 10 shootings and six homicides. And so we did our research and we were able to directly connect the release of the songs to shootings, release a song, shooting, release a song, shooting. Um, and now one of those individuals has received a record deal. So what does that do for the other little boys in the neighborhood um, who are trying to be something? And it's not a playground. It's not a lot of options. I want to be like him. And he's rapping about killing. And he just got 300 grand on a record deal, um, which he's blown because he's sick, of course. So he's drugged it away. Um, and so it's promoting the wrong message to my people. And I, I need to, if I can find the biggest mountaintop, to, this is not normal. This is not normal and it should not be allowed. It is not normal for any other racial group. It is not normal for any other social group that the promotion of killing and death of each other is allowed to the point now where our rap artists industries are taking out life insurance policies on them when they become rappers and they sign their record deals. Um, it's a scary reality. And the scariest thing is we're desensitized by it and it's gonna continue. Um, and, and, and so I, I almost envy the power and the impact of the LGBTQ community and how they are able to make things move for their people. I am desperate to have the same power in saving the lives of black boys. Um, so that's the biggest trend, the most important trend. And in terms of what can be done to help, that is one thing for sure, assisting us in promoting uh, the need to take it down. For example, in, in the UK, um, that's not, you can ban that on YouTube. You can flag it and you can have it taken down. We, in our research, we were able to find several studies in the UK where there are certain stipulations they put on individuals who are on probation or parole. You can't make videos like this. And if you do, we'll flag you and you need to take it down. And if you don't, you'll have charges pressed against you. Other videos make it to YouTube, child pornography or anything. It'll be flagged and removed. I want the same protection for the lives of my black men. Mm -hmm. You know, that is like, that, that's, a, that's a whole facet of anti-Blackness right there, right? I mean, just the, the normalization of it in so many, so many um, media outlets and, and mediums. Um, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. And I think there's probably a lot of interest from our, our audience about all the various things you brought up. And so I, I'm looking at Q&A and we have some questions here that um, I think I wanna start getting to. So, okay, one of these questions, it's kind of a two-parter. Let's see. Are there any or what are the current public policy initiatives that people can support to combat the way gentrification increases homelessness, um, which we know is heavily criminalized? So that's one question about public policy there. Along similar lines, are there decriminalization efforts around homelessness and other Jim Crow-esque crimes? Crimes, so to speak. So, um, Thank you for those. In terms of public policy, so I know the district has re recently, we were, we were the youngest agency in DC government. DC government has now established a new agency, the Office of Racial Equity. So we uh, will be working with them soon to identify what our agency's putting in place and do those um, services or resources or opportunities equally address the needs of, the, uh, of all racial groups. So that's gonna be a big help. And as that evolves, we're hoping that public campaigns evolve with it, that individuals can get on and support. In terms of homelessness, I know DC was ranked pretty high in terms of our youth homelessness. So being able to advocate for more group homes and placements for our young people would be super important. Uh, I know that there are some issues with where group homes are placed. 
Uh, so being able to have some of that red tape removed so that I don't have to group home a young woman, a young girl who lives in Ward 1 uh, all the way to Ward 8 because of different zoning requirements. So that would be really helpful. Uh, and just, just asking for more places to live or stay, uh, shelters, transitional housing, uh, but being and being intentional about that as we have been with our other new investments in the city with making sure we're keeping homelessness uh, in mind. Um, and I, there was another question around um, the homelessness or did, oh no, it was two inside of that. Okay. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there's another question. Who might be a key change agent in the music industry to take a first step toward um, the, the necessary shift away from glorifying Black death? Well, the key change in the first step has got to be my people. And so that's a part of what I've been doing here in the city is I have a whole list of our rappers and I'm trying to get with them one at a time to shift their trajectory and their obsession with each other and this obsession with killing. I too was an artist, so I, all, I work with them even down to let me see the lyrics. All right, change that to cool, change that word to I'm walking down the street, helping them rethink their lyrics, really assess their obsessions with each other, their obsessions with hurting each other and how that connects with their own hurt. So we would have to, as the artists, really change our trajectory. But in terms of the industry side, some of those main music um, labels, as well as our main media platforms, if we find ways to flag them from Facebook to IG and YouTube, and some of those bigger name executives like a Universal or a Virgin or Interscope Records to ask that this type of music be banned. If you wouldn't sell a song about raping a woman, it wouldn't be allowed. That would be quite gross. And it, the, ha, hearing that come out of my mouth was even a turn off. The same should apply for a song about taking out a gun and shooting a black boy. We should be disgusted, take it off immediately. Somehow, not only have we accepted it, we dance to it. And so something about that is sickening for me. Thank you. Um, I have another question. How, if at all, does violence interruption look different if it's with youth or school age folks versus adults? And, and you know, I also, I wanna you know, bring Mr. King back on too, if, if he wants to get on this uh, Q and A here. Uh, and it looks, it looks completely different. We're talking about maturity levels. Uh, we're talking about adolescence. Uh, uh, sometimes kids, uh, young adults, teens, as opposed to adults, right? Uh, we understand that uh, as of recent, that the human brain doesn't fully develop until about the age of 24. So just that alone should tell you the difference of how it looks. Um, uh, from a professional standpoint, we may be able to do more with an adult than we can do with a juvenile due to restrictions uh, because of HIPAA laws, based upon the fact that, you know, we have to uh, protect our children, right? Uh, certain things can't be disclosed. A kid may have a conflict that comes through the family court system that we may have a referral to. Um, I can speak of personally when we teamed with the Office of uh, Attorney General and I did a restorative justice for you who was uh, involved with a conflict. It was a lot of things that, that went into that. There was a lot of layers that went into that in order for us to even do that, right? As opposed to if it was an adult, I can just walk up and say, hey, let me talk to you for a minute and maybe be able to resolve it. Um, when you're dealing with youth, what I realize is due to the lack of maturity uh, and the lack of brain function on the adult level, they don't have the ability to process certain things. They see things in a certain way that makes it kind of hard as opposed to an adult. Sometimes a lot of things with adult is miscommunication. You know, um, someone in the middle is, is, is the person that's delivering the message and it gets delivered wrong and it causes a conflict. Uh, we seen that as kids when we was in and they said, say this in that person and by the time they get around the circle, it's completely wrong, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Prime example, just as a kid. And that happens as throughout life. So I think that that's the difference between dealing with a youth uh, in a conflict and dealing with an adult, uh, for lack of better sake, uh, just, just the overall mentality of the two. Uh, but one thing about the youth, uh, once they buy into you and they really uh, know that you genuinely care, you can pretty much like get them to do anything for you, literally. Like I've done it personally. I've been in conflict uh, resolution with youth where um, homicide was involved, you know, uh, and I had to step in and had the youth to resolve it and shake hands and walk away. And it hasn't been a problem since. And that was a couple of years ago. So, you know, that's the difference between dealing with, you know, youth and dealing with adults, if that answers the question that was asked. Yeah. Wow. Thank you.
We have so many Q and A's. Um, how about this? How has uh, COVID nineteen impacted your work? Have you had to shift towards more online interaction to keep in you know in contact with people? <laughs> no, <Yeah>. no. <laughs> We're essential frontline workers. Without a, without a gun and a vest, we then not only are we in communities that may be a hotbed for violence, but we was in communities that was a hotbed for COVID. Um, I'm a COVID survivor. My team took care of me. They made sure they looked out for me. I was admitted into the hospital behind COVID because I was in the community working, right? Um, like I said, this is a 24 seven job. Uh, COVID doesn't stop shootings, right? COVID doesn't stop conflict. That, that, that actually, it might even heighten it because they have more free time as opposed to going to school for eight hours. A youth may now have the whole day free because school is closed and they're not logging in for school, but they're logging in for Instagram the power of social media once mm -hmm. again, right? Mm -hmm. So no, COVID did not uh, actually uh, reduce our work in the numbers last year, as sad as, I, as sad as it may be, it was a clear evident that COVID didn't reduce anything so we had a record number of homicides here in Washington, D.C. last year. So, you know, if you look at numbers and, and you look at the data in those, in those uh, aspects, uh, it's a clear indication, you know, that COVID didn't reduce anything over the last two years, you know, um, and my office and Ms. McDaniels also know, and we can speak of it, I've lost a, uh, I've lost a, a, a person in my life during COVID to homicide, right? Um, so COVID that didn't do anything. Actually, COVID seemed like it enhanced it. It seemed like it gave out a lot of PPP money. It gave out a lot of small business uh, saving loans and the money went into whatever it went into. And it seemed like it made a spike in community. So we was hard at work. I promise you, we did not get the day off. We were working. We may not been reporting to the office, but we were in the community. Charles, I'm sorry for your loss this year. Thank you. Um, we have another question, and I don't know if this is if this is kind of the terminology that you use, but someone would like to know what would be one's top three projects to achieve in the next year, or maybe you know if it's not project, is it goals or something like that? Yeah, perfect. Good question. I think because we're so new and so young, our main initiatives are centered around expanding. Uh, so one of those things is to expand our violence intervention services. Right now, we're in 21 priority communities, 22 technically, and we're hoping to expand to 25. We're also adding a floating team and just more boots on the ground. So this year is around making sure the VI team has more people, more hands on, more boots on the ground. A part of that is adding a specialized case management team. So we want a contractor with clinicians who can help guide us through the, the side of the work that isn't the community, but the side of the work that is more specific to individuals and what they need, how to connect them to services. And that kind of trickles right into one of our goals and is where it's implementing restorative justice and trauma-informed care in communities. So we're implementing it as a service and an offering, but we're also implementing it as a training and a train the trainer so that community members themselves lead restorative justice efforts or participate in trauma-informed care uh, practices in the community. And then finally, community presence. It's a really big goal this year. We have more money now thanks to the COVID federal funding. So we're a, we were able to procure a videographer and a photographer. Um, we were able to uh, create a logo where we have a lot of swag items that we can give out. So now we can hit communities. We're branded. People understand who we are and what we do. And we can begin to increase our visibility and our community presence as well. Okay, that's awesome. Mr. For King, the record, you for the record, before you go into the next question, yeah, we're also present inside of the institutions here in the city as far as the Youth uh, Service Center, the New Beginning Center located in Laurel for Juvenile Justice, and the DC Jail as well as the Central Treatment Facility here. So I just wanted to elaborate because she said community, but I wanted to make sure that it was understood that our efforts go beyond the community because we do understand that if you're in conflict and you do something, usually a lot of guys end up in one place or the other, usually mm -hmm. the cemetery or prison. And if they wind up in prison and we know that they're there, we try to go there when they're sound mind, they probably not under the influence and they are very receptive to who we are at that moment because of the certain conditions that they're under where they are willing to help us try to resolve conflict. So I made I just wanted to make sure that that was touched on uh, on top of what Ms. McDaniel said because it's all it's not just all about the community. Sometimes some of the most influential people are incarcerated. Literally, uh, that guy from the neighborhood may be 
incarcerated, right? And he may have that ability to get on the phone and say, hey, man, listen, y'all going to do this with them because I'm telling you to do it, right? So I just wanted to make sure that that was touched on. I apologize for interrupting it before you went to your next question. I mean, that I think, thank you for highlighting that because to think about, you know, people may be removed physically, right? But the fact that you keep, that you keep those ties and you, you, um, you know, that they, that they inside, they have agency to shape the culture of the neighborhood is that's really powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and a, a student said uh, at Mason, um, we'd like to teach a lot about efforts to build capacity in communities abroad, but can you say more about how you empower community members to de-escalate situations on their own? And, that, and you know, let us know if that, is that even what's going on here, to de-escalate de situations on their own when you can't always immediately respond to that same situation. That's a good one. That one becomes difficult only because it's relevant to who we've worked with and touched, which is why we're real big on community code. So working with our partners to establish a new community code so that everybody knows how we're operating. Mm -hmm. This strategy is helpful for our VIs and for some of the young folk we've been hands on with. But if something pops off down the street and Miss Jackson hasn't worked closest with us, she may do her usual call the police or her son may come outside, you know, fussing and yelling. So this strategy is really effective for those we've been able to help and touch. The restorative justice services we're going to bring to communities is going to help with this as well. This will be the way we actually train and teach strategies. We can promote. So it's not just who we are already working with. We can go to a community and say, hey, we got 20 slots about to come up. Who wants to join and learn how to do RJ so that when you do see incidents uh, arise in your community, you can either A, de-escalate or B, just have a healing and repaired response to what took place so that you can assist in anything else uh, growing from that incident. Uh, so that's a great question. It's something we're really conscious of, and we're trying to implement formal trainings mm -hmm. for communities so they know how to do this. And in the meantime, for those who immediately work with us, we've already kind of talked and walked through the what ifs and the strategies on what can happen. And we know our triggers in our communities. We know on Friday, so-and-so, and they hang out right here and they drink too much and this may happen or mm -hmm. so-and-so's birthday is coming up. And it's going to be a big celebration and we want to get in front of it. So because we work hands-on with a lot of VIs and individuals we call community navigators, they may not be formally employed as a violence interrupter, but they work with us. We give them stipends to support. They know some some of those immediate strategies. And then sometimes we implement those as a part of that plan. So we may say, hey, if something happens, you know, the first step is to call Big Jason. And if Big Jason can't help, you call Charles's name is affectionately Booby in the community. So we might text Booby. And, so, and, and we'll teach these um, response strategies to certain key individuals who are intricately involved with us. But we have to find a way to expand that to, to those who might not be meeting with us on a regular basis. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a question that's interesting. So with the expansion of the US truth, um, racial healing and trans um, transformation movement, creating truth commissions toward racial healing, are you connected with any of these practitioners or are there efforts to create a commission in the DC area? I'm, actually, this is the first time. So I had made a note um, when I saw it pop up in the chat and highlighted it and put it off to the side because we have three years worth of funding to support restorative justice training. And so I don't want to repeat the same thing every year. We want to be super creative and start to identify new partners. Here in DC, there are like two really prime restorative justice leaders providing that service and training, and they are being burnt out and pulled on by everybody wants the same two folk. So now we're really forced, which is awesome, to look outside of the city and let's find some other providers uh, similar to the, the US Truth, is that the, the acronym? Um, and and uh, uh, for example, in Chicago, uh, the Community and Families uh, in Crises Center there who does restorative justice training. So we're looking to go abroad to get more support and we're looking to diversify our partners. So thank you um, to Leo Hilton uh, for that. Um, and we'll take that information and plug it in into our next steps. Leo, he's always bringing, he's always bringing the insight in every meeting. Um, this is a question that that possibly speaks to some level of intersectionality. Does one get involved in addressing harms within the community among different marginalized social groups? This person who writes the question says, I live in Boston and we are seeing 
um, with the LGBTQ community, an uptick in marginalization, uh, marginalizing them out of nightclubs, LGBTQ centers, does one have experience with this? Our, um, we don't have experience dealing with it in nightclubs. Mm -hmm. What we've dealt with is some of our LGBTQ groups have established little crews and they get into fights. They, they too have their own conflicts and social media things with their crews. So when we are aware of conflicts between LGBTQ, LBGTQ related groups, uh, we implement interventions with them as well. And when we approach it, we don't approach it under the guise of the LGBTQ label for us. It's just two crews at it again. And so we try to figure out what the causes are, who the key people are, uh, and put strategies in place to deal with that. We haven't dealt with a lot of uptick in crimes uh, with the LGBTQ community. Our LGBTQ community here is pretty strong, both new DC and old DC. As a matter of fact, we have had a, a documentary out about Check It. And so if you guys get bored, Google that documentary. It was super cool. And that covered an LGBTQ gang, for lack of a better word, crew here in DC that had evolved and from, you know, trouble fighting, protecting each other to uh, a business group uh, able to develop a fashion design brand. And so they were redirected as a part of an intervention specifically for them. And that was when we kind of saw the trickle down of the era of these LGBTQ crew clashes that was really, really big, I would say about five or 10 years ago. And more recently, things have gotten better. That's great. Um, I knew that, I, that there's a question from a student who is, is always thinking about design. And so I'm glad she picked up on that earlier in our conversation. A lack of playgrounds were mentioned, but I was curious if you've noticed trends regarding other elements of how our places are designed or not designed that contribute to or can de-escalate conflict. Are there common characteristics of places that seem to draw conflict to them? Good question. And there are some common characteristics, ingredients that exist that are breeding violence, like lack of playgrounds. Another thing we are seeing is lack of access to community centers. Some properties have community centers, um, but there always seems to be a challenge with our population gaining access to those community centers. Um, we may see some grace given like, okay, we'll give you guys a an hour on Fridays, but for the most part, there are not a lot of open doors for my young boys for them to be able to go into. So what it drives is a whole lot of outdoor hanging out. Mm -hmm. And so when you got a group of guys hanging out outside, then you're immediately more likely to be targeted or victimized. Um, one of the common characteristics of the locations that drives the violence is, you know, my people have a cultural need to be together and be outside. Because we're sick, bad things happen. Uh, but if we were not sick and if we were healed, um, I think that there needs to be a support of that need because it's a cultural need that we have to be together, to be outside, especially when the weather is nice. Um, and that's how we bond and socialize. And right now, because we're sick, that doesn't look so good. Um, and so that creates and breeds some of the common conditions we see that lead to violence. And then lastly, one of the common ingredients is, as I mentioned before, is an attack point. There's always the same attack point that the enemies use because we stand outside in these set spots. Everybody know you can find Booby at 3500 or 7th Street or whatever that location is. And we know that and people are drawn to that um, it makes us more uh, susceptible. Um, but being able to um, identify and then uh, modify the attack point would be critical. So we've asked for things like, let's put some speed humps, let's put a fence up, let's put a wall up. This broken gate that used to be a big security gate that locked is now just wide open and the enemies run right up here, they shoot, they run back down. Mm -hmm. So we've identified these attack points. So now we just need to work with other partners to be able to address them and deal with them. So lack of playgrounds, lack of recreational centers, having attack points, and then our cultural need to be together and outside is the ingredients that's driving homicides and trends in our city. Thank you. We still have more Q&A, but real quickly, I'd like to ask Matthew to give a quick plug around. Um, we have evaluation links for each panel. So just a quick plug on that and then we'll get back to Q&A. Yeah, uh, so if everyone could uh, either now or sometime later near the end of the event, click on the link that I just put in the chat. Um, it's, an, it's a really quick evaluation link. It takes like less than a minute, but it's a huge help for us as part of school of making sure that we're putting on the events that you guys want to see and that we're kind of, you know, building up the space that we need to to 
ensure that we all get this through together. So if you guys okay. can just click and do that quick survey, huge Thank help. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, back to Q&A. Um, another question, how do you experiment with more innovative or different types of strategies to violence interruption? Are there things that you experiment with? Will we want to take that one? Yeah, so we experiment, we try different, we, we, we do try different things. Uh, as Dana McDaniel said, or Miss McDaniel said earlier about um, the music program, uh, going into the communities, um, taking the residents of the communities out for healing events. Uh, those are things that's, that's, that haven't been done before. These are new things, right? Um, when she came to the agency, she had a vision. Um, she was here before I was, but her vision was what it is. And that's the reason that I'm here is because I'm part of her vision, right? Uh, that's the innovative work uh, doing not the traditional stuff, not just going in and making false promises, but actually going in and delivering, going in and getting the people that we know we need in order to be in these communities, in order to get uh, our work done. You know, it may not look good to some people, right? But it works for us. Uh, you may have someone who say, oh, she gave Tom a job and Tom used to be down the street with them all the time. But hey, Tom is an imperative person that we may need in order to do this work. And that's um, innovative uh, in today's time, uh, especially here in D.C. I believe that we're ahead of a lot of other places with some of the things that we're trying and some of the things that we're doing and some of the things that are successful uh, because we're willing to take that, that, that opportunity and that chance to uh, see if it works, right? Um, to go out and get a, a group of youth and tell them, hey, if y'all can do this, we'll incentivize it by giving you some type of stipend or something. Mm -hmm. Those are innovative ways because what we do understand is when we go into these communities and ask for these people to stop doing some of the things that they are doing, you must have an alternate, uh, alternate solution for them. If you're asking a person, hey, put down a gun, okay, well, what are we, giving, what are we putting in his hand? Uh, let's put a microphone in his hand. Let's put a camera in his hand. Let's put a book in his hand. Uh, things like that. Those are innovative ways may seem so regular to us as common people, but when, in some of these communities, those things aren't, aren't common at all. When you go into a household and you got uh, a two bedroom with seven people living there, it's not common for a kid to have a camera who may have an autistic side to him, an artistic side, not autism, artistic side to him that he wants to, you know, express himself through videography, right? Mm -hmm. So those are innovative things that we have recognized in our office that, hey, let's try these things and see how they work. And it's not all work. We're not going to tell you that we're 100%. But, you know, we do have a high success rate in the things that we do choose to do because we're strategically thinking them out. And not only are we strategically thinking them out, we're economically thinking them out, too, because we do have a budget and we must, at the end of the day, um, vouch for what we're spending our funds on and make sure that our funds are, are directly impacting the issues at hand, which is the reduction of violence. Right. Thank you. Um, Earlier, we had a conversation about um, partnering with law enforcement, but one person would like to know, do you have a role if community members are facing police misconduct or police violence? We do not have a role in that, but one of the things that we do um, in terms of working with community members is just some general conversations, meetings, and uh, skills uh, that we discuss in terms of how to engage police, how to communicate with your police officers, um, how to avoid distressful situations that police officers may be involved in. Um, and But in terms of misconduct, if we do have a concern in the community, um, we do have MPD partners that we might reach out to, um, to say, hey, we had a report of the MPD uh, went into a community once and rolled down the windows and blasted the murder music of the rival in that community. So they're in the community and they're like, wait, I hear my enemy's voice. Where's that coming from? And it's coming from an MPD car who decided to antagonize on, on that day. So those are examples. And then we reach out to the partners immediately. And then we have conversations and resolve comes right away. So we're really thankful for a lot of the responses we get. So communities do reach out with concerns and we will advocate for them, but not directly in terms like formal reporting or formal strategies to deal with misconduct but informal ways that we can casually bridge gaps or try to rectify wrongs we do work on that wow thank you as that. well as as well as uh attend a and c meetings with the communities um 
which is a neighborhood advisory committee meetings uh, where police are usually present to speak. Um, I personally sat in meetings with uh, certain communities uh, that we're and, 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 and the police was there, right? So, you know, I was there to hear out what was going on. You know, sometimes people feel empowered when um, people from other agencies are there. Some people may not want to speak, uh, but they may feel more comfortable because if it does go the way that they, that they think it's going to go, then they can look at us and say, hey, you see what just happened. And I might can report back to Ms. McDaniels and say, hey, Ms. McDaniels, I went to the meeting. And, you know, the police officer was completely rude or, you know, he basically, you know, disregarded everything that the people were saying by being combative, right? And maybe through her relationship, she's able to speak to a superior or someone out of that office and say, hey, uh, you know, one of my staff members did attend an ANC meeting or attended a community meeting with the police. And this was what transpired. So uh, we do uh, move in that capacity as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question of how do you see gender dynamics playing out in your work? There's been a lot of talk in particular about, um, you know, conflict between young men, but, um, and boys, right? But, you know, and, and I take, take the question, however, you know, there's a lot of ways to interpret it. Yeah, one of the answers that immediately comes to mind is some of the trends that have changed. We recognize that a lot of the disputes between our young men unbeknownst to us a lot of times mm -hmm. are related to women common women that they may have in mind we also know that women um, aid in some of the social media promotion that we see when things come out uh, women are usually more active on social media uh, one of the trends we saw in the summer of COVID uh, when the PPP loans were hitting was scamming scamming took over as the main crime we had to shift away from worrying about regular social media drama and start to hone in on scamming, which led to the homicide of several women, which was unusual for us because it's like, wait, they're killing girls now? What's going on? But it was all connected to the scamming and how a lot of the young women were being used in those ploys and kind of um, having some money issues along the way, some deceit and some deception taking place. And it was resulting in that it being taken out, taken out and the women suffering the consequences for, you know, maybe they didn't give a person all the money in, from the account, all kinds of little things we were finding out that our women played a role in um, uh, having guys who flew in from other states with their PPP loan money, they'd be waiting for you right at the airport. So all, all kind of little weird things were happening that involved women. What we're seeing now, even we have a class called Pathways where we have 25 individuals at a time. And one of the requisites to get in that class is being exposed to gun violence. But we don't have that as much with our women. A lot of the violence we see with our women is still domestic. So we're trying to find ways that we're going to change the criteria when we do a Pathways for Women. And the criteria may not have be directly connected to guns. Uh, another gender trend we often see is a lot of our young women who identify as male. They are actively involved in a lot of the male on male, the common uh, crime and homicides that we see. They're part of those crews and, and intricately running around with some of those guys. Um, and then the other gender dynamics we look at is how we pair, making sure we have both men and women present in our communities. And when we do a lot of that one-on-one -on -one work, making sure we're just mindful of how that is paired up, making sure our women are safe, making sure our men are covered if they have a, a, a woman in their car, having a second person there to avoid out any trouble uh, occurring as a result of that. So those are some of the things we look at as it relates to gender. And Booby, I don't know, I, I thought you may have been trying to jump in there. Uh, just, you know, with, with the gender, she pretty much touched on, on pretty much everything for the most part. Um, we see uh, we see more out of out of the young men or, or men or the male, for lack of better words, than we do out of females uh, with the conflicts uh, that we are involved in directly. Uh, as she said, like women play more so an indirect uh, part in the type of work that we do at this at this current time. But like you, like she was telling you, there will be a, a, a female who may have a relationship with too few neighborhoods, and she's in one neighborhood. And then you look up, she's on Instagram in the other neighborhood, right? And that that you know, some people let it slide, and some people see it as a conflict, right? And, you know, we have to be ever mindful of that when we're addressing things, you know, and, uh, if it gets that serious, we may have to, you know, speak to the young lady. Hey, you know, you're putting yourself in danger and you're feeding the fire on both sides. So, you know, can you please, 
you know, disregard going into even neighborhood for your safety, you know, and if you are going to go in one neighborhood, you know, make sure that you stay in that neighborhood. Don't be running back and forth because it's, it's, it's a conflict. Uh, we understand that, you know, a lot of conflicts throughout the world over years have been about women. This isn't a new trend that started right now. This is a uh, fact based, based on records through the Bible or any other text that you can find dating back hundreds of years. So now it's just more hands because now I can see that the girl is over there. I don't got to think she's over there. I know she's over there because she's just posted on social media. It sounds, I mean, just, you know, I'm listening to, to just a, a, a part of, of that kind of conflict. And it, it sounds like, is there, are there matters of control? Like trying to control people's mobility or people's relationships? No, I don't think so as much. I think that it's, it's a matter of influence. The, the, the ability to post something on social media and totally sway groups is quite um, profound. Um, and so we are working to really identify some of those key influencers on social media and start to identify and connect with them to help us in promoting things that are more positive. So we'd watch individuals take uh, an innocent matter and all it would take is the right person to comment or post and it'll shift the energy of that thing that quickly. So that's one of the, the dynamics that we see in terms of control that we try to try to get in front of that, that social media influence. So you can change a whole community's uh -huh. emotional reaction if you get under the video and say, I hate it or y'all playing with us. And then now it's a it's a conflict just off one person's comment. So just being mindful of the influential power and control that individuals have, especially when using social media. Okay, and just to be clear, I was not saying that your office is trying to control. No, no, no. We not. Know, no, yeah, like, we we I, didn't get, right, like, I did not get that out of that question. Yeah, I promise you I did. Okay, good. <laughs> yep, that same, didn't even cross my mind. We'll be clear. Um, so we're talking a little about gender, a little bit more about age now. Can you see, uh, or can you say more about the, your efforts to bridge the generation gap um, and what you do to help younger people and older people see each other in a positive light? This is all about community conversations. And we have a whole campaign we're kicking off in May to go to the communities, figure out what groups have gaps and just hold circles where we have everybody present and we're talking about, well, what do you need and what's affecting you? What do you need and what's affecting you? I think the biggest part to bridging the gap is understanding and tolerance and acceptance. And if we all understand each other, then we can better adjust to each other's needs and then better tolerate and accept. We have one community that comes to mind right away that we've been trying to get a conversation, but the community pillar, the resident is a bit resistant right now. She's not ready to sit down with those knuckleheads making all that noise and getting on my nerves. And we're trying to engage her like, you got to sit with them and hear them. They need to sit with you and hear you too. They need to know that your music is a problem. I've been working, living here 60 years. I'm retired. There's certain luxuries I was looking forward to. And I think that if they're just able to hear each other and understand how they affect each other and allow us to implement some resolve, then that will be much simpler. So we're excited about our community conversations coming up for the summer. And we'll be documenting those as well. We'll videotape some. Uh, we'll just do some note documentation and summaries on others so that if this works, then it can be a part of our model. Okay, excellent. Thank you. I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, is there anything that you would like to address about, about guns? Uh, they are way too common and everybody has one. And we're watching what used to be just a blow the horn and flip the bird road rage is turning into pull out a gun and fire shots. Every morning when I read the MPD report, there's at least one road rage incident where they say the suspect in the vehicle pulled out a gun and shot at my car. You know, we were racing to get over and instead of just a regular blow the horn, we have a brandishing of weapons. So right now it's just way too common um, everybody has a gun and everybody is anxious to use it. And so that's a concern that we've highlighted and we're just trying to address when we get into communities, trying to coach our guys to not carry guns as often, not have them with them as often so they won't be apt to use them. Um, Charles, did you want to jump in on that one too? Um, gun trends? The gun trend is, is um, not only does everyone have them, the capacity of the magazines that they are carrying now. Um, 
we I watched it evolve. I've lived here. Uh, I can remember police carry six shooters, right? And due to the influx of uh, uh, money during the crack epidemic here in the city and throughout the United States, um, it, it, it afforded uh, individuals to get larger capacity guns, which means the police had to elevate their guns to what we see them carrying now, which is usually a Beretta style gun or Glock uh, model uh, make of, of a firearm. Um, now, uh, those guns were 17 shots or whatever that the police was carrying, but now you got uh, people running around the streets with not just handguns, they're running around the streets with assault rifles, right? And these assault rifles sometimes have 100 round drums on them, right? Um, we've been in situations where we know that uh, people have dropped countless shields, right? Uh, in, in the midst of using these guns. And I think that that's another another thing. I think that uh, with the larger capacity magazines, it emboldens the the you know the perpetrators of the people who are carrying these firearms to, um, to to be more bold. Like I can outgun you, I can I can outshoot you, right? Mm. Um, along with uh, modifying guns, guns are being modified, right? Uh, it was just on the news maybe a couple of months ago that you can buy a giggle switch from. Uh, from uh, at one time, I don't know if they took it off, but on Amazon, you could buy a giggle switch and turn a semi-automatic handgun into a fully automatic handgun. And the giggle switch was like $19. So uh, those are the things that, that, that you know that has really changed as far as the gun culture here, right? And uh, you know, ghost guns that someone has just put up, right? Uh, you can order a ghost gun and basically put it together yourself just watching YouTube. So it's, it's, a, it's a host of things that go into the guns. Um, but I think that the, the biggest thing is the capacity, the magazine mm -hmm. capacity. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if you listen to music now, everybody who's rapping, they got a switch and they got a, they got a beam and they got a hundred round or they got a 30 shot, right? Like the minimum magazine now, the average seems like is a 30 shot. And if the police only have 17, hey, I got 13 more bullets than you and don't have a car full of people with 30 shots, right? That's 120 shots. And you got one officer walking up to the car, even with two officers walking up to the car, you know, they're still out, out gone. Maybe even with the extra magazines on their uh, belt, they still don't have the, the ability to even, you know, um, go up against that force and for the lack of better words. So, you know, from the gun point of view, I think that that's, that's one of the biggest things now because I think it embodes them. It, it excites a lot of people that I got this and it makes them want to use it more because now they have this, uh -huh. right? And, um, and it's, being pro pro uh, it's being promoted through music. Oh, thank you. So that, I mean, my mind is like, oh my goodness. Um, we, have, we have a few minutes left and it, I, I want to go out on a note of, of, of constructing and building. And so one of our questions is, um, what kind of rituals or traditions do you see that seem to add to community cohesion? Um, what is your typical question. usual community events and activities where you're coming out, you're meeting and greeting, having uh, things that are for the youth and for kids? Uh, but one of the most important ones that we see, and Charles has actually led, so he may be able to better speak to this, is the restorative justice and healing events that we do in communities, especially after they've experienced a tragedy. Uh, so Booby's done a good job at visiting some communities to do that um, after a tragedy has been experienced that we go out and offer some form of circle, prayer, healing, some form of repair. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, tragedy is driving cohesion. So we want to get on the front end of that and be proactive and let the good drive the cohesion. Let, let a community event. We're going to put a memorial gardens in some of our communities that have declared peace. And we'll put the names of our sons we've lost on those gardens, maybe little plaques, maybe an artist may draw it. And we'll have the community come out and let's do a prayer over this garden. Let's uh, designate this as a sacred space in this community uh, so that we can move forward. Things like that. That healing activities are really the kinds of things that that uh, bring communities together that are in pain. Thank you, Mr. King. Um, like Dana said, man, we just really want to go into these communities and offer these services. Uh, we did, we do, we do do healing events. Uh, we did one a couple months back, and uh, we actually did the healing event in their neighborhood. Literally, uh, there was a hotel. They hung on one corner. 
The hotel was on the next corner, literally on the same block. Uh, only thing that separated them was a driveway to get into a grocery store. And we had the whole community come in and they came in and they was very receptive to it. And they was very happy that we came and we did all the services and, and gave them the opportunity to, you know, come there and decompress, right? To uh, feel human, to have those emotions that they may not have an opportunity to have when they're standing outside because it's a cold world. Um, it's dog eat dog. And, you know, uh, they, some people don't have that opportunity uh, to really do that. We're really trying to just be most definitely hands on with everyone and uh, address anything that's going on. And uh, Miss McDaniels know that I sent her screenshots of texts from people who tell me, I need you. My life is in danger. Right. And that's real. So, you know, that's the work that we're into and that's what we do. Hey, I just want to thank the two of you so much. You have um, you have been dropping jewels all over the place. You are you know elevating our our um, our sense of, of of where we live and 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 the community that we belong to and how we can you know how we can act and act with you you know and um, so this is the beginning. I hope of a partnership, not just you know we're building. We've been building for a few weeks now. Um, but but our our greater community here at Mason um, that you know we'd like to see you know ourselves as partners with you and um, so I want to thank Charles King and Dana McDaniel. I also want to thank I didn't get to thank earlier Kenya Lewis of the Ones Office who has been strategic in you know organizing us and you know just keeping us on track. Um, it just it's a great it's a great thanks to to you Kenya. Um, and so everyone, thank you so much for attending and, um, and please, you know, fill out the evaluation form. That would be really helpful. Um, and please join us for other Peace Week events. If you want to get in touch with, um, with ones, um, I can act as a facilitator of that information um, and, and we can connect. So thank you all so very much. Appreciate it. Thanks everyone from team ones. Have a good day.